Hello there, everyone. In this module, we'll be learning about liver cirrhosis. Let's begin by learning the etiology. Cirrhosis is a diffuse, irreversible hepatic process characterized by fibrosis, regenerating nodules, and distortion of the normal hepatic parenchyma. An acute or chronic disease process injures the liver cells, which then undergo inflammatory changes leading to necrosis and fibrosis. Subendothelial fibrosis leads to the impairment of normal hepatic functionality. Some common causes of cirrhosis, hepatitis C, which is the most common, alcoholic liver disease, the second most common, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and hepatitis B. Less common causes of cirrhosis include autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and drug-induced causes. Now let's move on to talk about the pathology of cirrhosis. Cirrhosis was historically classified morphologically as micronodular, macronodular, or mixed. Micronodular cirrhosis is characterized by nodules that are less than 3 millimeters in diameter and was believed to be caused by alcohol, hemochromatosis, cholestatic causes of cirrhosis, and hepatic venous outflow obstruction. Macronodular cirrhosis is characterized by various size nodules that are larger than 3 millimeters and was believed to be secondary to chronic viral hepatitis. The morphologic appearance of the liver may change as the liver disease progresses. Micronodular cirrhosis usually progresses to macronodular cirrhosis. Now let's go over the physical exam findings. Patients with cirrhosis present with several physical findings, including the following. Jaundice. Hyperbilirubinemia may also cause the urine to appear dark or cola-colored. Palmer erythema. Spider angiomata. These are most frequently found on the trunk, face, and upper limbs. Petechiae. Ascites. Physical findings in patients with ascites include abdominal distension, a fluid wave, and a flank dullness to percussion. Hepatic encephalopathy. Gynecomastia. Gynecomastia is seen in up to two-thirds of patients with cirrhosis. It is possibly caused by increased production of androstenedione dione from the adrenals, enhanced aromatization of androstenedione dione to estrone, and increased conversion of estrone to estradiol. Caput medusa. Asterixis. A physical exam of the liver may reveal an enlarged, normal, or small-sized liver. If palpable, cirrhosis causes it to have a firm and nodular consistency. Head and neck findings in patients with cirrhosis may include parotid gland enlargement and feeder hepaticus. Parotid gland enlargement is typically seen in patients with alcoholic liver disease and is probably due to alcohol, not cirrhosis per se. Feeder hepaticus refers to a sweet, pungent smell to the breath of a patient with cirrhosis, the presence of which suggests underlying severe portal systemic shunting. Now let's talk about the clinical manifestations of cirrhosis. Compensated cirrhosis patients will classically present with nonspecific symptoms, such as anorexia, weight loss, weakness, and fatigue. Decompensated cirrhosis patients may present with more specific symptoms, including confusion, ascites, edema, hematemesis, pruritus, and melina. Patients with cirrhosis may experience muscle cramps, which can be severe. In women, chronic anovulation is common, which may manifest as amenorrhea or irregular menstrual bleeding. Men with cirrhosis may develop hypogonadism. It is manifested by impotence, infertility, loss of sexual drive, and testicular atrophy. 
It is a feature seen predominantly in patients with alcoholic cirrhosis and hemochromatosis. As cirrhosis progresses, patients often have a decrease in mean arterial pressure. Patients who were previously hypertensive may become normotensive or hypotensive. The decrease in mean arterial pressure contributes to the development of hepatorenal syndrome and is an important predictor of survival. Next, we'll learn about the child pew classification of severity of cirrhosis. The modified child pew classification of the severity of liver disease is according to the degree of ascites, the serum concentrations of bilirubin and albumin, the prothrombin time, and if the international normalized ratio and the degree of encephalopathy. For the first parameter, one point is assigned if ascites are absent, two points are assigned if the ascites are slight, and three points are assigned if the ascites are moderate. For the next parameter, if there are less than 2 mg per deciliter, or less than 34.2 micromoles per liter of bilirubin, then one point is assigned. For 2 to 3 mg per deciliter, or 34.2 to 51.3 micromoles per liter of bilirubin, then two points are assigned. And for more than 3 mg per deciliter, or more than 51.3 micromoles per liter of bilirubin, then three points are assigned. In the next parameter, for more than 3.5 grams per deciliter, or 35 grams per liter of albumin, then one point is assigned. For 2.8 to 3.5 grams per deciliter, or 28 to 35 grams per liter, then two points are assigned. If there are less than 2.8 grams per deciliter, or less than 28 grams per liter, then three points are assigned. In the next parameter, if the prothrombin time, which is measured in seconds over control, is less than 4, then 1 point is assigned. If it's 4 to 6, 2 points are assigned, and if it's more than 6, 3 points are assigned. For the next parameter, if the international normalized ratio is less than 1.7, 1, 1 point is assigned. If it's 1.7 to 2.3, 2 points are assigned. If it's more than 2.3, three points are assigned. For the final parameter, if there is no encephalopathy, then one point is assigned. If the encephalopathy is grade one to two, two points are assigned. And if it's grade three to four, three points are assigned. A total child Turcotte Pew score of five to six is considered child Pew class A, which is a well-compensated disease. A score of 7 to 9 is Class B, which shows significant functional compromise. And a score of 10 to 15 is Class C, which is a decompensated disease. These classes correlate with 1 and 2 year patient survival. For Class A, the survival rate is 85 to 100 percent. For Class B, it's 60 to 80 percent. And for Class C, it's 35 to 45 percent. Now let's talk about the diagnosis of cirrhosis. The gold standard for diagnosing cirrhosis is liver biopsy. However, it is not necessary if clinical, laboratory, and radiographic studies suggest cirrhosis. The pathological features of cirrhosis include the presence of fibrosis, regenerating hepatic nodules, and a decreased number of septa. Ultrasound is the most common imaging in the evaluation of cirrhosis, as it allows the physician to assess the contour of the liver, impedance of the blood flow, and amount of ascites within the abdomen. Other helpful imaging modalities include a computed tomography of the abdomen, radiographs from the chest and kidney ureter bladder views to assess for secondary complications of cirrhosis, and magnetic resonance imaging. In the workup of cirrhosis, there are several laboratory tests that are required to assess the functionality of the liver. Common laboratory tests include bilirubin, aspartate aminotransferase, alanine aminotransferase, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, 
prothrombin time, which is prolonged in cirrhosis, platelet count, which is low in cirrhosis, and the electrolyte panel, which should have low sodium if cirrhosis is present. Patients with cirrhosis are susceptible to several complications, including ascites, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, variceal hemorrhage, portal vein thrombosis, cardiomyopathy, hepatopulmonary syndrome, hepatorenal syndrome, and hepatic encephalopathy. Portal hypertension is the underlying cause of most of the complications associated with cirrhosis. As the pressure becomes severely elevated, venous blood begins to back up into the esophageal and gastric veins, resulting in varices and even ascites. Now let's discuss treatment. The primary focus in treating cirrhosis is the treatment of the underlying disease process. This involves managing toxic insults and preventing serious secondary complications. Beta blockers are used to help keep the pressure low when the patient presents with esophageal or gastric varices. Lactulose is used during acute hepatic encephalopathy. Lactulose prevents the absorption of ammonia. It is theorized that ammonia and other neurotoxic metabolites build up in the bloodstream and gain entry into the brain secondary to liver failure. A transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt is a procedure performed when patients present with severe portal hypertension. This procedure creates a new route for blood to pass through the damaged liver. Ultimately, transplantation is the only cure for a cirrhotic liver. Before transplantation is considered, the patient's prognosis is calculated using either the child pew classification or the model for end-stage liver disease. Thank you for listening to this module about liver cirrhosis.